Okay. So, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so I'll do a quick introduction, um, and then I'm going to look at three different examples of vulnerability reports that have been received by the Apache Tomcat project and how they've been handled. And as you might guess, they start off being handled pretty well, and it gets worse and worse and worse. Not all of it was our fault. Um, I've got some reflections at the end, sort of lessons that we've learned, things that we're going to do differently. In terms of questions, we'll keep a little block of, que of time for questions at the end, but feel free to ask any questions as we go along. So uh, for those of you that weren't in the last session, uh, my name is Mark Thomas. I'm a committer on the Apache Tomcat project. Um, additionally, I help out in the infrastructure team. I'm a member of the AS ASF-wide security team and a member of the ASF in addition to um, dabbling in various other projects around as well. My day job is as a staff engineer at VMware, where they basically let, just let me get on and do Tomcat development, which I love. Um, when I'm not doing that, then I lead the Spring Source security team, which handles all of the vulnerability reports in the Spring Source family of products. Uh, and I work on VMware's TC server product, which is essentially built on top of Apache Tomcat. So we're going to start off with the good, which is really how security vulnerability reporting and handling is meant to work. Um, and this really does apply to the vast majority of the Tomcat reports. We get between five and 20 <coughs> valid reports a year. I, I went back over the last six or seven years trying to see if there's a trend going up or going down, and no, not really. Um, they just seem to come in fits and starts. Um, a Tomcat vulnerability usually applies to multiple versions. So it's unusual for something just to apply to Tomcat 7 or just to apply to Tomcat 6 because they share so much common code between the versions. If it applies to one, the chances are it's going to apply to all of the others as well. Um, looking at the Tomcat 7 vulnerabilities that have been announced to date, we haven't had any critical ones yet, which is good. Um, we've actually had more important than anything else, a couple of moderates and um, a few lows. It usually takes us months to get from disclosure to us to a formal announcement and the main reason for that is because it affects multiple versions then we need to get releases out of all of the older versions as well and the older versions are on a much slower release cycle typically every four to six months so if a, if we get a vulnerability report just after the previous release then it's going to be another four to six months until we do another release it's a bit of a red flag to people if we do a two tomcat six releases in a week it normally suggests there might be something wrong with the first one. Um, so we, we don't, you know, we, we do that if it was a really serious issue, but generally we don't. <coughs> so the good example I'm going to discuss is CVE 2012-2733. And this was a problem that just affected the NIO, HTTP connector. And um, what had happened was m some time ago, we put in some code that basically limits the size of the HTTP headers that Tomcat will accept in a request. The reason for that is the servlet spec requires us to keep all of those headers in memory so the user can query them later. So if you allow an infinite size of headers, then you have to be able to allocate an infinite amount of memory, and you're very rapidly heading towards a potential denial of service attack if somebody sends a really large set of headers in a request. So Tomcat limits those headers, and by default, it limits them to 8K. The teensy, tiny little problem we'd made in the NIO connector was we did check the size of the headers, but only after we'd read them and loaded them into memory. Um, so obviously you could still upload an, a very large header, you could still cause an out of memory error, and you could still cause the Tomcat to fall over. So slight technical error on our part there. Um, and that was reported to us on the 4th of June last year. Um, well, it was reported to the, actually it was reported to the Tomcat team, but due to some infrastructure issues around the way that security lists were working at the time, it didn't actually get through to the Tomcat team, but it did get through to the security team at ASF wide. They forwarded it to the Tomcat team the following day, who acknowledged it to the, the original reporter um, straight away. So that all worked really well. A couple of days later, we got the test case written. A few days after that, we got a proposed patch. So we then got in touch with the OP again. It's look, yep, yeah, it's confirmed. It's definitely a problem. Here's the proposed patch. Um, We've asked for a CVE. This is the CVE we've got. This is how we're going to refer to it. Um, how do you want to be referred to in the announcement? And then a couple of days after that, the 7.0.28 release happened. And then a few months later, the 6.0.36 release. And because the 6.0.36 release took so long, um, we didn't have to worry about 5.5 because 5.5 was already out of support by that point. Um, it, this one did affect 5.5, and we knew it affected 5.5, but we didn't actually do a release. 
So on the 19th, once 6036 was released, we drafted the vulnerability announcement, sent that to the OP and said, this is what we're planning on saying, are you happy? Um, they came back and said, yep, fine, that's great. And on the 5th of November, we actually sent the announcement out. So that's how things are meant to happen. What I should say is every time we sent an email about this vulnerability, we made sure it was copied to the security list, our, our own project security list. The way the lists are set up is any project-wide security list automatically gets cop any message to that list automatically gets copied to the ASF-wide security list. So one thing you don't need to do, if it's got security at tomcat.apache.org in the list, you don't need to put security at apache.org in as well, otherwise we just end up with two copies of the message and it's mildly irritating. Um, so you just, if you're sending it to a, a project's list, it's automatically going to the ASF wide list as well. When you send an email to uh, the OP or to any other organisation, make sure you CC the security list. So A, the ASF has a record that the email was sent, and B, the, AS, the security team can see that you are actually talking to the original reporter. Because otherwise, if we've sent, if we've sent a, a um, message to you to, as a project to action, and we don't see any emails going out after a couple of days, we're going to start hassling you to say, uh, why haven't you dealt with this yet? And if the answer is, oh yeah, we dealt with that days ago, we sent them a message, you'll say, yeah, that's great, could we have a copy of it, please? So just make sure you copy the security lists on any messages you send so we've got a full record of what's going on. So that was uh, 2733 and how it went bad, how it went well. Next is the bad, and this is really the many, many, many ways that I've managed to make a mistake. Um, and there are quite a few. And hopefully you'll be able to learn from these and not make the same mistakes yourself. So first of all, with 4431, Fundamentally, every security vulnerability is going to start with a coding error. Uh, whoever, whoever's written that, that bit of code that's got the vulnerability has made a mistake, and yet I've done that loads of times. Um, all you can really do is try, when you're doing your coding, is just try and do it with, with, with sort of a security mindset and think about what you're doing, particularly if you're doing security-related code, as I was here. Um, try and think about all of the edge cases and make sure you cover them all. Um, this particular problem was I'd forgotten one of the ed to cover one of the edge cases. Um, I was writing a cross-site request, for request forgery prevention filter, and I hadn't taken account of what happens if a request was made to what should be a protected resource before a session exists. Um, and the answer is it should have been refused, but it wasn't. It just bypassed the filter and carried on. So that was a mistake on my part that actually one of the other Tomcat committers picked up, and we got that fixed. The next one is awfully easy to do, 3439. That's when somebody sends you a report, you look at it and think, utter nonsense. Now, barely worth responding to, it's so bad, um, when actually there's something in there that's right. Um, and this one was a, a weakness in the digest authentication. Um, and the, what really started me in, in the wrong direction here was the report itself started off with about three or four statements. And the first three were blatantly inaccurate. C clearly, demonstrably, complete and utter nonsense. Which kind of meant I dismissed the fourth one. And the fourth one was right. Um, and the fourth one was saying, you, you're using the wrong nonce in this bit. You should be using the server nonce rather than the client nonce or vice versa. I forget exactly what I did wrong. But essentially, I'd misread the RFC and hadn't implemented it properly. And this reporter had correctly identified that. But because of the, the first three statements were, were so wrong, I dismissed the fourth. Fortunately, um, I wasn't too dismissive when I sent the response back. So the, the original reporter was nice enough to say, yeah, actually, um, I think, yeah, fair point, fair point, fair point, but no, I think this point's still valid. And then we had a little bit of back and forth. Um, I rechecked the spec, realized I'd made a mistake, held my hand up, and then we carried on and fixed it. But it's awfully easy to do. Um, so I think you do need to be careful when you're looking at these vulnerability reports, even if they look utter nonsense. You need to look at each bit and check that each one really is utter nonsense rather than just dis dismissing all of it based on how you've read the first few lines. Um, the next one was 4534, and that was a case of not spotting or not thinking about the security implications. We had a bug report. It was an infinite loop um, in a particular use case. If a client was connecting over SSL and sending some data and they disconnected before they'd finished sending the data, then the CPU entered in infinite loop. 
you only needed one client for every CPU core you had to do that, and you had absolutely no CPU left. Um, and that's obviously a denial of service, and we didn't spot it, or we didn't we did we either didn't think denial of service, or we just thought oh. It's, too much hassle to create, get a CVE for this. We'll just fix it. It's a public bug anyway. It's fine. It's in the change log. And what we really should have done is got a CVE at that point. I can't honestly remember whether we just didn't think or we actively chose not to, but that should have had a CVE. And then a few months later, our good friends at Red Hat came along and said, um, excuse me, uh, this bug report here, um, that looks like a denial of service. So shouldn't it have a CVE? And we had to go, yeah, you're right. Sorry about that. Um, Mark, can we have a CVE reference, please? So we then did that and um, sent out the announcements and updated the security pages. Um, something else that, can, that wasn't really our fault. Um, t this is going back a few years now, um, 2938 in 2008. You can get coordination headaches, particularly when the vulnerability is in something as widespread as the JVM. And all of a sudden, you've gone from what started off as a, yeah, Tomcat doesn't handle UTF-8 properly, or it doesn't handle invalid UTF-8 properly, and that can lead to directory traversal. And what should have happened is the UTF-8 should have just been rejected, and the whole, the whole thing should have just had a 400 response. Um, and the OP thought they'd found a Tomcat problem. And we looked at it and thought, ah, that's not a Tomcat problem, that's a JVM problem. We're using the JVM's decoder and it's not handling this properly. Uh, that means lots of other web containers have probably got the same problem. It poss given that all of the JVM vendors start off, at least start with their code starts with Oracle, you know, they'll, they'll tweak it themselves and do some platform specific stuff, but fundamentally it all starts with Oracle. Chances are all the JVM vendors are involved as well. This is going to be fun. Uh, and it was. It didn't help that Sun didn't accept that it was a security vulnerability. Um, now, arguably, they're, they're probably right, it was just a bug, um, but it meant they didn't move particularly quickly to fix it. Um, and information started to leak out, and lots of vendors were rapidly patching their um, application servers to work around the problem. And meanwhile, we published this vulnerability. Yeah, it's a Tomcat vulnerability, um, yeah, we didn't handle this properly, blah, blah, blah. And then once the JVMs were fixed, then um, that's when we actually updated it, updated it, said, no, it's not really a Tomcat problem, it was a JVM bug, and provided some more details. Um, Bill actually did a lot of the coordination amongst the, uh, the JVM vendors for that, and it wasn't fun, was it? No. <laughs> not yeah, fun. It's fun, absolutely. Well, and, and this is what, and we'll talk about this a little later, but uh, one, one thing of server design is to be permissive in what you accept strict in what you send, and this is one more example of where that can bite lead you down the wrong path. Yeah. Um, and there was actually a, a second problem with this one, which was um, entirely my fault. Um, I'd got a draft vulnerability all announcement all prepared, and I sent it to the users list for review rather than the security list. Oops. <coughs> um, so it was published a little bit sooner than I was intending. Um, but fortunately, nobody objected to the draft, so we just resent it properly. Uh, but that, that is awfully easy to do. Um, <coughs> sorry? Did you get any thank you notes from uh, bad people? <laughs> no, well, the, the, it was all fixed. It was all just, uh, everything was ready to go. It was just effectively premature announcement. Um, the thing that you particularly need to watch out for is email clients that handily autocomplete addresses. Um, or show real names rather than email addresses. Um, you have to be incredibly careful where you're sending this stuff to. Okay, yeah, the ugly. Um, this, this was probably the worst security vulnerability we've ever had to deal with with Tomcat in terms of just how the handling process went. Um, I was, I'm still sufficiently annoyed about what went wrong that there was steam coming out of my ears while I was typing these slides. I'll, I'll try and hold it together for the presentation, but forgive me if I lose it a bit. Uh, it was just a complete mess by the end of it. So how did it all happen? This is CVE 0022 from 2012, and it started with a hash collision problem in Java. Um, and if you put a whole pile of values into a Java hash table that all had the same hash, then the performance just fell off a cliff. Um, 
And it was affected Tomcat because we parsed HTTP parameters and we put them into a hash. So both the names and the values are user controlled. So the user could construct um, hash collisions very easily, which then caused a, a performance problem for Tomcat. Again, Oracle didn't treat this one as a vulnerability. I'm still sort of on the fence as to whether they should or whether they shouldn't. Uh, probably they were right in not, because it was really Tomcat's fault for um, not using the hash table safely or correctly. Um, although arguably other, other vendors that provide sort of JVM equivalents have fixed the, the equivalent hash table implementations in, in their products, but yeah, it's, it's one of those borderline cases that really could go either way. Um, throughout this, I have changed the names of the guilty parties in order to protect their identities. Um, it's actually not that hard to pierce the protection if you really want to. I'll, I'll leave it up to you if you, if you want to do that. Um, what I will say is that as a project, Tomcat has dealt with security vulnerabilities from a, a wide range of reporters, some directly, some through one of the various coordination agencies there are around the world. And the vast majority of those have been professional, helpful, knowledgeable, and absolutely no hassle at all. In these slides, I'm going to use Org X to refer to the organization that actually passed this particular vulnerability to us. And in terms of timescales, we're looking at autumn 2012, sorry, autumn 2011 to early 2012. So it starts off with a couple of reports to the Apache wide security list. The first one says, yep, there's a problem with hash collisions in Apache Geronimo. And the second one says there's problems with hash collisions in an unnamed ASF project. It just says your project. It doesn't tell us which one it is. Um, so the first thing the ASF security team do say, yeah, uh, we've got about 100 of these things. Which project were you referring to? Suspecting they were going to say Tomcat because if it affects Geronimo and it's to do with HTTP, well, that's, that's going to be Tomcat. Um, and they did indeed um, identify Tomcat as, as the project with the potential problem. And they passed on a Metasploit proof of concept, which the, the OPs had written. This, this is just sort of one of my um, sort of pet hates, really. The chances of a project using exactly the same tool chain as you are slim to none. If you have, a, if you want to provide a, taking Tomcat as a, or any other servlet container, if you want to provide something as a sort of a working example that they can work with, for a servlet container, the most useful thing you can do is provide a war file, because that is guaranteed by the specification to actually run. Um, as it happened, I didn't have Metasploit set up. I didn't even have it downloaded. Never used it before. So it took time to, to get that up and running. Um, the same with bug reports. Um, you know, somebody sends me a Maven project. Well, the first thing I actually have to do is install Maven, because I don't use it. Um, so those sorts of things can slow things down. If there is an obvious common standard way to provide a proof of concept to a project you want to report something to, use that standard way, it'll help everyone. Anyway, Metasploit wasn't that difficult to get up and running, um, but it, it did just take a little bit of time. The other thing they told us was that the embargo date for this particular vulnerability was going to be the 27th of December, which struck me as a monumentally bad choice. It's the middle of the holiday period. The chances of IT departments actually being fully staffed or you know, anything above barely staffed is slim to none. Um, it is really the last time you want to announce something that looks like a very easy to exploit remote denial of service. But they were presenting at a conference. So they couldn't bring it forward and they wouldn't push it any further back. So there was nothing we could do about that. Um, just had to live with it. That, that was a minor annoyance. Anyway, so we took this proof of concept they sent us, and we started running it. And what we found was Tomcat's parameter parsing was horribly, horribly inefficient. Um, it would do things like store all of the parameters in an array. OK. But it would start off with array of size 1. And then if it got another parameter, it would create array of size 2, copy the previous array into it, and add a new one. And then when the next one came in, it would create an array of size three, copy the previous parameters into it, and add them. So that was fine when you had sort of tens of parameters, not so good with thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. And there were lots and lots of issues like that. I think there were about five or six problems, all told. So we fixed all of those, um, and none of them were related to hash collision. There, there was not a hash collision in sight at this point. 
Um, so with all of those fixed, we then ran the proof of concept, and Tom Clark went, yeah, and? It was fine. There was no denial of service. There was no excessive CPU. Um, it was completely in line with what you'd expect for dealing with a request of that size. So, okay. So we got the fix for these unrelated denial of service issues, and at the same time, we thought, well, there might be something to this hash collision thing. So the prudent thing to do will be to limit the number of parameters we'll actually let a user send. And because we could now see how Tomcat responded to large numbers of parameters, we knew that, well, actually, if we set the limit at 10,000, that's way more than anybody is ever going to want to send, but it's way below the point where even without all of these silly errors fixed in Tomcat, Tomcat would actually quite happily handle 10,000 parameters, even with all of these performance issues not fixed. So that seems like a reasonable limit. We'll put that limit in as well. So now we had to go, oh, sorry, we got a CVE for all of the denial of service issues because they were denial of service problems in the parameter parsing. Problem was now we had to go back to OrgX and say, um, yeah, that proof of concept you sent us doesn't work. But we couldn't just say that because clearly it did, but it worked because of a completely different problem. So we had to explain to them that, no, we've identified a number of denial of service issues in the parameter parsing. We've allocated CVE 4084 to those issues, but... With those fixed, we cannot reproduce the hash collision problem. Um, so we left it as that, um, and we started committing the patches for 4084. I guess the next thing that happened pro might, perhaps should have been the sort of the first warning that things weren't going to go quite to plan. Um, when we got an email back from OrgX that indicated they really hadn't understood that no, the hash collisions didn't work. There's a there were a completely separate set of issues that we had to fix. So we ha had to send another clarifying issue, trying to get the message across. Right, hash collision, not a problem. Parameter parsing, denial of service, whole bunch of problems. 4084, we fixed. We are in the process of fixing them. Um, also that day, I make one of my far too frequent errors, and I actually accidentally commit all of the performance tests in the unit tests that I've been using to prove that these denial of service issues exist to the unit tests. Um, nobody really notices, we get away with it. Um, so the next day, OrgX asks permission to pass on the patches that we've, we've told them about for these unrelated issues to some unspecified vendor list. We don't actually reply. My, per my personal feeling was absolutely no way, but I didn't want to sort of if somebody else on the PMC felt strongly enough to say, yes, we think they should be distributed, I wasn't going to stand in the way of that. But we actually never did get round to replying to that question one way or the other. So to my point of view, that, that was effectively, it was a no. If we, didn't, if we don't say yes, then you definitely don't distribute information that's been passed to you in confidence. But we actually didn't respond to that question. Um, Meanwhile, we spot a couple of other fixes f that are required for the parameter count limit to make sure it applies in all circumstances. We catch a few more edge cases. We do a bit more analysis. Um, and come early November, we've got all of the fixes in place in Tomcat 70X trunk to fix the denial of service problems that we found. A little bit later, we, we start working on Tomcat 6. We, again, we're trying to do all of this relatively under the radar. We haven't said anything publicly about this. I think it was just billed as improving parameter parsing or refactoring or something equally innocuous. Um, on the 16th of December, we get copied in on an email where OrgSX has requested a CV for the hash collision issue in Tomcat, to which we respond fairly properly, uh, excuse me, uh, we told you we couldn't reproduce that. That's not valid. Why are you requesting a CVE? And again, alarm bells maybe should have rung a little bit more loudly that do they perhaps really understand what we've been telling them. Um, so OrgX finally puts us in direct contact with the original reporter. Um, the, the original reporter says they've um, done some testing with our latest code and they've got some problems with max parameter count where it's not applying and they're having all sorts of problems and we just can't reproduce it. So at this point, my confidence in the quality of this report is a little bit undermined. Um, really not sure what's going on there, and to this day, I don't understand why they had the problems that they said they were having. Um, I suspect they hadn't actually, um, they weren't using the, the latest code that they thought they were using. They were using an old SVN tag or something, but still not entirely sure. Anyway, 
Um, after a little bit of discussion of, between us and them saying, well, your Metasploit proof of concept didn't work. Isn't that strange? Anyway, here's an updated one. Um, we ran it, and it did actually demonstrate the hash collision issue in Tomcat. Um, so Tomcat was vulnerable to this particular problem. So uh, we get back to, to the OP and say, thank you very much. That's great. We re re reproduce it, see where you're coming from now. No problem. Um, we'll handle this um, through OrgX as you've requested. So we tell OrgX that we can now reproduce the problem. And we also tell them that the max parameter count that we've already introduced sort of as a safety measure does actually address the issue. So as far as Tomcat's concerned, yep, we've confirmed that is actually a vulnerability, but we'd already put a mitigation in place, so we're good to go. Um, again, we get a clarification email from OrgX asking which CV are we meant to be using for which issue. So we try to make clear again that um, 4084 is for the Tomcat parameter parsing problems, and whichever CVE they'd like to issue us with is for the hash collision problems. And then on the 28th, um, the OP, having done their security conference, actually announces the issue. And we think that's pretty much all. You know, we wait until... Um, uh, so no, we, we announce our workaround, max parameter count, at the same time, effectively in response to the announcement to the hash collision problem. And now we think, okay, everything's all done and dusted. We just need to wait until we've got a Tomcat 6 release. Then we can announce 4084 and tell the world about all of the other non-hash collision problems that we found. Um, and then on the 3rd of January, we discover, um, I forget how, I think by just looking something up on MITRE, or no, tell a, light, a question came in from Red Hat about what's... Um, 4084 all about, to which our response was, how on earth do you know about that? And I'm wondering, well, I know Mark Cox, who leads the security team, works for Red Hat, but he's pretty good, and I don't think he would have told his team about this issue, but maybe he did, and if he did, I'm a little bit annoyed, but wonder what's going on here. And then we do a bit more digging, and we look on MITRE's website, and we find out that under CVE 4084, what it should say is this CV has been reserved. What it actually says is a full description of all of the parameter parsing problems in Tomcat that we haven't announced yet, along with a statement on the bottom that oh, and hash collisions were a problem as well. So we're thinking, what on earth is going on here? It's like the two issues have somehow been merged. Um, clearly, somebody has leaked something. Um, information <coughs> that shouldn't be in the public domain is in the public domain, and frankly, I want to know how it got there. So I send an email out to everybody we've ever communicated with which is basically the Tomcat security team, the um, Apache security team, the folks at Red Hat that reported us, this to us in the first place, the original reporters, and all X, saying um, information about this has leaked. Um, the ASF is not happy. Uh, would the person who did this please own up and explain what was going on? Um, at the same time, because there's now this confused mix-up between the parameter parsing issues and the hash collision issues, we take the decision that actually 4084, we're just going to abandon it. And we're going to get a new, we've, got, we've already got the CVE that OrgX gave us for hash collision. We're going to get another one for our, for our parameter parsing issues, and we will keep the two separate. So at that point, we get the new CVE, which is 2012-0022. Um, in response to that email I sent out to everybody saying what on earth is going on, I, I got a private email back from Mark Cox, the Red Hat security guy who also leads our team, saying, um, yeah, Orgex sent out information to one of the vendor security lists about this a few weeks ago. Here's a copy of the email. So it was, they did what? Colour me very unimpressed. Um, but I've got a copy of the email, so, so I now am pretty sure I know what happened, um, or at least where the information came from. At the same time, we discover that when OrgX did their announcement of the hash collision vulnerability, they used the wrong CVE. Rather than using the CVE that they'd requested for hash collisions, they used the CVE that we'd requested for the parameter parsing. So they put out two separate notices, one that had said, oh, Tomcat has got this CVE 4084, which is a bunch of issues with parameter parsing. Then a little bit later, they sent out another message that says, oh, Tomcat's got a hash collision vulnerability, reference 4084. So what happened um, was that MITRE, who received both of those emails, matched them up, 
match the CVE references, did exactly what you'd expect them to do, given that they're meant to refer to the same thing. Said, so, oh, right, okay, this information has now been public. This stuff we got privately before, we can now make public. And they basically merged, merged the information and published it on their website. And I don't blame MITRE for doing that at all. Um, they acted based on the information that they'd, been, they'd received. Um, yeah, it, 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 was a, it was an error, but it wasn't of their making. Um, they were told, they were given information about 4084, and then they were told that 4084 was public, so they published it. That's fair enough. Um, also that day, I got an email from OrgX quite strenuously denying that they'd been the source of the leak, almost as if I'd accused them of it. Which you'll note, I'd actually sent the email out to everybody involved, and it was only OrgX I got the denial from. Hmm. They also said they didn't think they needed to apologise for anything. Um, so after um, retyping the same email about five or six times before I was able to tone it down to a level where it was appropriate to send, um, I sent them an email suggesting that they might want to check again because I've got a copy of the email that they deny sending. Perhaps they want to look in their outboxes. Um, so they respond to that saying, oh, no, 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 no. We, we only ever sent the information to the original reporters. Um, so I send one back saying, look, okay, here's a quote from the email that you sent. Maybe now you'll be able to find it. Um, so they, they respond that they finally, oh, you mean that email? Oh, that wasn't a leak? And they basically denied, Abs not our fault, Gov. No, we didn't do anything wrong when what had triggered all of this was, A, them sending out the information in the first place. We'd given them information about 4084 in confidence, and we needed to do that to explain why we thought the hash collision vulnerability didn't apply to us, even though the proof of concept suggested that it did. And we had to provide that information in order to justify our position. They then sent that out to a whole bunch of people without asking us. That is a fundamental no-no. Um, if you receive any information about a security vulnerability, you do not pass it on to anybody without the explicit permission of the person that gave it to you in the first place. Um, and they broke that rule, so I was not happy. Secondly, by announcing the hash collision vulnerability with the wrong CVE, that's what triggered the publication of the information. So that was, again, definitely their mistake. And um, yeah, they basically denied it and refused to apologize. Um, and the ASF told them quite politely that we disagreed with that view and left it there, because there really wasn't anything else we could do. Um, what we did have to do was clear up the mess that it left behind. So we had a talk to MITRE and basically get them to just kill off 4084 and just look, it's a complete mess, get rid of it, um, and re put references in to uh, 2012, 22, which has got the right information about the parameter parsing and whatever the CVE was for the hash collisions, which number, the number of which I forget. Um, once, about the same sort of time, we completed the patches for Tomcat 6. Um, it just so happens that we held off on the last few things until we were ready to do the Tomcat 6 release. And there, there was, we could have got this done months ago, but the Tomcat 6 release wasn't ready till early January, so that's when we um, put the last few patches in. We got the Tomcat 6 release out, and then on the 17th, we formally announced all of the um, parameter parsing issues that we discovered. And as I say, I was more than a little bit displeased. So some reflections, and I'll um, keep this fairly quick. We have, as I said, Tomcat has a potential problem with the time to report from announcement, and that's to do with having to backport it to older releases that don't get released so often, and that, that tends to drive our announcement schedule. Um, it's all, it's, it comes down to we end up balancing how severe is the issue, when's the next release due, and it's a judgment call, and it's one the PMC makes as a whole. Um, poor quality reports, you have to take them seriously. You know, e even if the first 20 lines are utter nonsense, the 21st might be really useful. So um, however frustrating and annoying it is to deal with these things, you have to read them all. Um, bug reports, whenever you're looking at, a bit like whenever you're coding, whenever you're looking at a bug report, look at it with a security hat on as well. You know, is there a denial of service issue here? Is there an information disclosure issue here? Should you be doing something more like issuing a CVE as well? Yeah, double check your address e list before you send it, particularly if it's displaying real names rather than addresses. Um, I did have a problem for a while where, for some reason, the Tomcat security list 
was showing up as the Apache security list because somehow in my address book in its auto-completion, auto-filling thing, it had got confused. So I had to go and clear that out. Um, coordination authorities, the vast majority of the time, they are incredibly useful. Um, there will, you know, like any large organization or large group of people, there will be a couple of bad apples. The problem is you don't know who they are until it's too late. Um, we start, the Tomcat team in this case started off from trusting OrgX and knowing that they knew how to do their job and they were doing it properly. Um, that cost us. You know, that's what, you know, had, had we taken a very paranoid view of things, then maybe this might not have been as big a mess as it is. Um, and unfortunately, I personally now default to not trusting them. Um, until I've actually dealt with them a few times and they've demonstrated that they know what they're doing and they know how to do it properly. And th that's perhaps a bad thing because that, that's less coordination, less cooperation. But my primary concern is the security of the Tomcat users. And to keep them secure, I have to keep information about security vulnerabilities private. And that means I can't share it with people I don't trust. Um, and whilst these coordination authorities should be vetting the people they employ, um, experience suggests that that doesn't always work. So my personal view is I now take a much more paranoid approach to these things. Okay, so we've got about five or a little bit more than five minutes for questions. Yes, one at the front here. Um, are you expecting that all teams, whenever they fix internally find bits of vulnerability as opposed to an outside researcher, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the question is, if a team internally identifies a security vulnerability and fixes it, does that team need to go and get a CV and announce it? The answer is yes. Um, you've got a lot more control over when you announce it um, and how you fix it, but yeah, if it's a vulnerability, it needs to have a CVE and it needs to be announced publicly. Any other questions? Yes, over there. Mm -hmm. Is that just going back to you know, what, is, what is the source of security? How secure is it? Um, it strikes me as a long time. Okay, so the question is why, is it, why in a number of those examples did it take a couple of months from receiving the report to actually having a patch um, in the code base? And what it comes back to is that as soon as we commit a patch, that information is public. And it's trying to balance when, there's going to be, when, the, when is the next release going to be and getting the patch in there for the next release without having the patch there for too long um, to announce it. So it, it, you end up sort of trying to balance um, when's the next release going to be, um, how obvious is the patch that it's security related, and how <coughs> frequently does that particular Tomcat version have a release. And for Tomcat 7, it's really not a problem. We release every month. Um, so if we get a security vulnerability in the middle of the, middle of the month, pretty much certain the next release is going to, be, is going to include the fix. The problem is the older releases, that because they take, you know, they're typically released every four to six months, then it's, well, when do we do the patch then? And we obviously don't want to announce until after all of the releases have got, um, have got uh, patches in them. Now, that, that's a strong argument for, we, you know, we should be releasing Tomcat 6 more often. Um, you know, if we had Tomcat 6 on a monthly release cycle as well, problem goes away. Uh, that's simply a question of resources. Um, you know, I can keep on top of, because I'm the Tomcat 7 release manager, I can keep on top of releasing Tomcat once a month. Um, if, I, if I was having to release Tomcat 6 once a month as well, I'd be, I'd be doing rather less work for my boss who's sat over there and he wouldn't be too happy with me. Um, so it's, it's, it's always a balance. So we do look at the severity and if it's a really severe issue, then we'll do a release quite quickly. But at the same time, that does potentially flag to people that there's something interesting going on that, oh, hang on, there's, a, there's only been a month between Tomcat 6 releases, why is that? And that's when we'll start looking for excuses, um, be it, oh, well, there's a regression in that library and we want to update to the latest version, or, oh, well, that's a particularly nasty bug that one of my clients is, is having problems with, so you know, work is pressuring me to do a Tomcat 6 release, or so just make up some excuse for why we're doing the release. Um, what I think we, we rarely accelerate releases because we rarely have critical vulnerabilities. Um, for important ones, we tend to think that actually it's, 
if there, if there was an active exploit, then we'd discuss it publicly and talk about workarounds um, and probably get a release out fairly quickly. And that, again, that's one of the factors that would drive us to, to do an earlier release. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those kind of judgment calls, and we're, look, we're looking at, we're trying to balance all of the things we're trying to do, and bearing in mind that we're a volunteer organisation. You know, even those of us that are, are paid to work on it, we're still, you know, from the ASF's point of view, we're all volunteers. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. Um, you know, ideally, I'd like to be able to get you know, more releases out more frequently for all sorts of reasons. It just comes down to not, the project as a whole just not having the resources to do that. As it happens, I think getting a release out once a month for Tomcat 7 is pretty good. Um, that's probably better than most Apache projects manage, certainly the ones that I'm involved in anyway. And, and, it's not, and you're not the only bottleneck either, or the release manager isn't the only bottleneck, because we don't, we don't release code until three other, or until three project members have voted to, to approve that release. So boy, and we run into this every once in a while at HTTPD, where if uh, you know, something is of less interest, uh, some module um, is of less interest, uh, we may, it may take us a while to get enough voters. Yeah. If we were to try this every two weeks, every month, it's not practical. Yeah, and the other thing, um, because of the way Tomcat runs its releases, internally Tomcat 6 is uh, review then commit. So you need three PMC members to say, yes, that patch is acceptable before you can put it in the code base. Um, and if there aren't three PMC members that are particularly bothered about that security vulnerability, then it can take a little bit longer. I mean, if it's security related, it's normally that, not that hard to, to get some interest together. Um, but that can cause things to take a little bit longer as well. And then if you're going to do a release, then you really need to fix all of the, at least the bugs is, that are in the status file as well, so that needs a few more votes. People need to find time to review the patches, and it just slows things down a bit. Yeah, Tomcat 7 is still commit then review, which means we can move a little bit faster. Okay, I think we're just about out of time. So if um, anyone else has got any more questions, uh, feel free to come and find me afterwards. But for now, thank you very much.